Hi, it's Tom from Lone Horizons, and welcome back to our Dungeon Crawl Classics playthrough of Dyson's Delve solo. Before we get started this time around, there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. The first one is we had the Um Actually guy in the last episode uh, pop up in the comments, which is actually really good. I'm not making fun of him or anything. Brian Rabin was uh, last times um, actually guy who pointed out that when a wizard does spellburn in Dungeon Crawl Classics they are not allowed to burn their personality or their intelligence probably because they're sort of not physical stats and the wizard is supposed to be tired out from doing it. He mentioned that you can only spellburn strength, agility and stamina. So what I have done is Grob because Groban burned two points of personality last time, I have changed it so that he actually burned two points of stamina. And he ha already had a minus one modifier for stamina anyway, so it hasn't really made any change to his stats. I've just noticed I wrote that spellburn note there, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put an SB for Spellburn next to Stamina, just to make sure we don't forget, because that will take two days to grow back the two points of Stamina, two days of full rest. Okay, another thing I wanted to mention is I just bought a book um, on downtime and domains. It doesn't even say who wrote it on the front cover, but uh, let's see. On Downtime and Domains, Procedures for Populations, special reference work. Courtney C. Campbell wrote it. So anyway, the reason I got it was because it has basically a load of stuff that you can do in downtime in old school RPGs. There is a D&D 5th edition version of this as well. This is the one for... Uh, I can't remember what it's called, BX d, &D or something, one of the really old ones. But uh, it basically, you know, the same thing that all the OSR games are based on. But it's got some interesting stuff. It's got stuff about generating uh, cities and towns that they can go to, activities and labor. The first, the first chapter in that is called Orgies, um, <laughs> which is quite funny. Sacrifice, Rumours, Healing, Relaxation, Rodomontade. I don't know what that word means. Maybe we'll find out later. Skills, Learning, Talents. There's loads of stuff that it gives your players to do in between adventures. And I think it could be really nice for us because we don't have anything else in our game, in our campaign, apart from this one dungeon it could be nice for them to spend their money on things when they go back to town. It's also got rules on henchmen, things like that, hiring henchmen, selling, how to sell really high value items in the markets because, you know, if you collect big valuable bits of loot in a dungeon, you may not be able to just go to the local village market square and sell it to the local, you know, junk shop guy for thousands and thousands of gold pieces so that could be useful and then you've got class specific things like arena fights which fighters can do assassination which also not also yet heva could do because she joined that assassin's guild as a chaotic thief and all her thief class titles are based on being an assassin as well so i thought maybe once she reaches level two the guild might start sending her out on missions. So that could be quite fun. Gambling, things like that. There's loads of stuff in here. And yeah, I just wanted to mention it. Oh, and it's also got the all important constructing a fort because this is something I've been, I've been wondering about recently. I know that in old school D&D, once the characters reached, can't remember if it's sixth level or ninth level, basically whatever was considered the maximum level they were expected to spend all their money by on building their own fort and then sort of retire there like clear a load of land of monsters and then build a fort in the countryside retire there and then they would become 
basically Lords of the Manor, and then the gameplay would change from basic dungeon crawling and trying to get loot to more kind of political schemes and armies being directed around the countryside and that, that kind of thing. And I'm wondering, I've never actually read or heard from anyone of that kind of gameplay actually happening. So if you are an old grognard, as they call them, and you used to play D&D in the 80s or the 70s or whatever, and you actually did that, let me know in the comments because I'd really like to hear what it was like. And maybe constructing a fort for our characters could be a kind of end game thing where at the end of this campaign, we'd, you know, map out the castle, build it, and then they'd retire there. And then maybe, you know, if we ever return to this world on this channel, they could then be high level NPCs that are like quest givers or something like that. Could be good. Yeah, I don't know if we'll, if we'll get that far. I definitely want to finish Dyson's Dell, the dungeon, and get all the way through it, even though it's, you know, it's probably going to take me a year at this point or longer because we're still on level one after 13 episodes. But anyway, yeah, on downtime and domains, I got it from Drive Through RPG, and this was a print on demand edition of it. And it seems pretty, pretty good quality, really. Quite nice, look at that. <laughs> look at that. I didn't, I've never seen that before. This is a table of go goblin mischiefs. What goblins are getting up to in town, I suppose. Um, so yeah, anyway, I've been reading it. I've read quite a bit of it actually already and I recommend it. So yeah, I didn't mean to go on about it for that long, but I am quite excited to, to start using it. We'll probably have a look into it next episode. Okay, so basically just one more thing before we get to the all important moment where we're gonna meet Groban's turtle familiar and he's gonna tell us his name. I've just decided he's a he's a, a male turtle. I don't know why. It, I, it just just that was what occurred to me. So that's what we'll do. Before we get to that point, I completely forgot that Orsiet, the cleric, not only is she carrying a vial of holy water, which she could throw at that zombie to kill it. Um, she can also do lay on hands, which I don't know which other. RPGs that's in. I know it's in Dungeons and Dragons, um, but I don't know how common it is. So I kind of forgot about it. Like it's not in, it's not in Scarlet Heroes, which I play solo and I GM one on one, and it's not in Basic Fantasy RPG, which I'm playing a cleric in at the moment in a group game, a group game run by Stonax Tabletop Gaming. Um, Paul from Stonax Tabletop Gaming who has a really really good YouTube channel on here where he does a lot of solo gaming um, Anyway, that's that's neither here nor there, but yeah clerics can do lay on hands in this which is a way of just healing Healing people using the power of their God. So we're gonna do that I know last time we went out into the wilderness and we rolled a, um, a wilderness encounter, which we will have. We're not just gonna heal and then go back into the dungeon straight away and throw the holy water on the zombie, which we could do. But I just kind of um, feel like I should stick to the original plan because we already rolled that encounter. So uh, yeah, for now, um, let's get on with the healing. And it is at, like everything in Dungeon Crawl Classics, it involves looking up, looking up things on tables, rolling some dice and uh, checking people's alignments and stuff like that. It's, it's not, not as simple as it could be. So let's see. I won't read the whole thing out. Uh, by making a spell check, a cleric may lay on the hands to deal damage to any living creature. Okay, so they do... She does a spell check as normal, like she's casting a spell. And here's the table that you check for that but also they heal basically a number of dice, a number of hit dice for each person that they try and heal each time. And I've just read it just now. Apparently we're just gonna be able to heal one hit die uh, for each character um, that we have, and it will be their hit die. So like, uh, I guess I need to check 
what hit die they roll to level when they level up and get their extra hit points. But Orsiet needs to heal herself because she lost a hit point, and she needs to heal not not Walton. He didn't get hurt. Oh, Heva the thief, because she is on two out of seven. So, firstly, let's try healing Orsiet. So you do the spell check, and then depending on what alignment the person is compared to the priests, the, the cleric's alignment, you get uh, different results. So, oh, okay, so that is how many dice they get to heal. Uh, interesting. Well, actually, because we're level one, we can only heal one anyway. So the number of dice healed cannot exceed the target's hit dice or class level. For example, a cleric healing a first level character cannot heal with more than one die, even if they roll well on their check. Okay, so it's either going to be failure or, or success. So for Orsia, let's do this for her. Okay, so her spell check is 1d20 plus 1 because she doesn't have a personality modifier to add to it. She only has her level, which is one. Oh, that's good. 18 she got. So uh, 14 to 19 on the spell check. Same alignment, because it's herself. She would get to heal three dice. Um, obviously, she's only lost one hit point, so we don't even need to check what her hit die to roll is. We'll just heal that one hit point for her. Okay, that is good. So that's her all healed. We're doing this just outside the ruins where we um, exited the dungeon from and before we go on our journey where we have an encounter that we haven't rolled for yet. Okay, and then we've got Heva, who is chaotic alignment. Also yet lawful, so that's basically opposed. So let's see, failure, oh, it's still, it's not that different actually. Failure is still the same, one to 11 on the spell check. It is quite easy to fail these. Okay, so she is gonna do that. We will, let's check the thief's hit die to see what it is. Okay, a thief gains 1d6 hit points at each level. So she will heal 1d6 hit points if this works. Okay, so 1d20 plus one. 15, so that is a success as well. And then let's roll a d6 to see how many hit points Heva can regenerate. Five, that's good. Okay, oh, that takes her back up to her maximum of seven. That's really nice result. Good, okay, so um, Orsiet puts her hands on um, Heva and uh, on Heva's wounds and starts to chant a prayer to uh, oh god what was he called Klazath uh, the god of war and as she's chanting as Heva is miserly Heva says you're not going to charge me money for this are you I can't I can't afford to spare money I'd rather just go back and uh, rest in bed for a few days and Orsiet says of course not of course not um, even though you're an assassin I still believe that you deserve the healing power of Klazath. And so, yeah, a magical light streams out from the wounds and they close up. Okay, and um, so as they're doing this, a turtle approaches them. It comes out of a bush by the side of the ruins and um, introduces him, himself to Groban. He, here he is, I've added him to, I haven't made a character sheet for him, but I have added him to our little reference sheet of uh, character details. So we can see he has a bite as his weapon, his attack bonus is plus one, his bite does 1d3 damage, and he's got armor class 14, and he's got six hit points. So the characters look at this turtle approaching them, and Groban immediately recognizes the turtle as his familiar that he called. He had a vision a week or so ago when he did the ritual spell to summon the familiar and he saw this turtle's face 
in his mind <laughs> as he did it. The face was revealed to him. Um, so the turtle approaches the party and walks up to Groban and says, you Groban, are ya? And Groban says, um, yeah, I am. And the turtle replies, my name's, and let's find out what that name is. So we've got nine suggestions from people uh, who watched the last episode. And I don't know if there's like someone watching that episode right now as I record this and they're adding a, adding a suggestion to it, but it's not gonna make it, unfortunately. So we are gonna roll a D10. And if it's a 10, we will um, uh, re-roll. But anyway, the list of names that we have are Turtle Angelo, Myrtle the Turtle, Gary, because he's garrulous, Dyson, Clainmail Chad, named after the zombie that's currently on one hit point in the tomb, Mortimer, Shelley, the same person, Dice Tales, recommended uh, both Mortimer and Shelley for male or female, but I think you could call him Shelley anyway, just because he does have a shell. Um, I think that's just a really fun name to have, so I included it anyway. And then uh, Jute and Hemp, because Groban is a rope maker. Um, that was Renato Freitas suggested those two names. So yes, a couple of people have suggested multiple names and that makes it more likely that one of those people will get their one picked. But this is this is Dungeon Crawl Classics, which is extremely unfair anyway <laughs> um, when you're playing it. So I think that, that makes sense. All right, so let's roll for it and see, see what it is. Two, it's Myrtle the Turtle. Robin Vayner suggested Myrtle the Turtle. Okay, that is a great name. All right, so let's write his name in. I think Myrtle is a, is a girl's name as well, but it's fine because it's just funny. Okay, Myrtle the turtle. All right, so he says, Myrtle the turtle. And uh, Groban says, well, it's great that you uh, made it here so quickly. Um, if you want to join us, uh, yeah, yeah, come, come along with us. And he's like, all right, yeah, sure. I'll join you, I'll follow you along follow on behind you, but um, I'm not too quick on my feet. So uh, bear that in mind, just try to try to um, let me let me tag along and I'll try and keep up with you, but don't go too fast, all right? And Groban's like, yeah, okay, that's fine. That's no problem. And I've actually had my movement rate slowed because of you already, so I can empathize with you a bit. So yeah, they've got their new party member. So we now have a party of one, two, three, four, five, plus the sheep that survived the last delve into the dungeon. Unfortunately, the sow didn't. The sow's currently being eaten by the zombie, but we do have the unnamed sheep with us, which they can't be bothered to give a name <laughs> because it's probably not gonna last much longer. So anyway, let's get on with the journey back to the village and um, we need to roll for that encounter. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to use my zine Hexcrawl Horrors that I recently made a YouTube video about where I kind of went through it and explained what it is. But if you didn't see that, just really quickly, this is designed for use with basic fantasy RPG because or really any any RPG that's you know old school because basic fantasy is free and it has a massive bestiary of monsters that you can use and uh, I went through it and, and made all these tables based on the wilderness type so we are gonna roll on this uh, we're in the plains because there's just plains between the village and the dungeon. We're not, it's not like a really long journey. It's only one day. So it's just basically like we're walking across the countryside. And I think what I'm gonna do, even though this is kind of cheating with my own, with my own um, little zine, is I'm just gonna roll a D30, not a D100, because I've organized them by hit dice for kind of, uh, 
just for fun so that when you roll a d100 if you roll a high number you know that you're going to be in for a big fight so like a griffin is one of the higher ones or a troll or a basilisk but um i was thinking about this and the main challenge of this campaign is supposed to be the mega dungeon that we're exploring and i don't want to get sidetracked and encounter like a dragon in the wilderness when we're walking back to town if there's a dragon at the end of Dyson's Delve as the last boss or something like that. It would kind of take take something away from, from the challenge. So I'm just going to roll a d30, which means I'll get one of the lesser monsters. So uh, yeah, let's go for it. Let's see what it is. 27. Hobgoblins! Ah, we've just... We've just been fighting hobgoblins. Well, they may not be hostile, but they may well be. We know that hobgoblins live in this area. Okay, so I've got the page number for the hobgoblins in basic fantasy, but I do. we were using the stats of the hobgoblins in um, Dyson's Delve. So why don't we... Um, well, why don't we see if they if they're a creature in Dungeon Crawl Classics already? Okay, so Cyclopedia of Creatures, Monstrous and Mundane. There are some quite weird monsters in Dungeon Crawl Classics. Androids are in it, which is weird. Like they maybe they've been left by some long ago ancient civilization that was really advanced. Okay, anyway, hobgoblins. They must have hobgoblins, right? Okay, so after some back and forth between different rule books, I've decided to use the rule book for basic fantasy because it has a section that tells you how many of the monster normally appears in the wilderness, whereas Dungeon Crawl Classics doesn't. Um, and Dyson's Delve, although it has stats for hobgoblins because we've met them, it doesn't actually tell you that. So 97 is the page number in basic fantasy. Uh, let's see. Hobgoblin. Number appearing. Wild 2d4. Okay. Great. Let's do that. This is how many there are. Six hobgoblins. Okay. I guess I need some kind of procedure to, to check whether our characters have kind of seen them first or what. I, I never know what to do in this situation in um, like hex crawling and stuff like that in the wilderness uh, when there isn't specific rules. But um, I think it is an encounter. So we do encounter them, which means we should kind of come face to face with them. I guess we'd see them off in the distance. Heva, the thief, has good chance of hiding and stuff like that, but the others aren't thieves, so they wouldn't really have much of a chance of hiding from them. So I think we're just going to encounter them and see what happens. So I need to find my reaction table. Okay, that's the monster reaction table. We'll roll 2d6 on it. And um, does anyone have a per like a high personality modifier or any personality modifier. Heva doesn't. Groban doesn't. Maltin doesn't. And Orsiet doesn't. Okay, so we just roll 2d6 and we will see what happens. Eight. Unfavorable. Okay, so they don't attack straight away. But uh, they they, let's say they see us, they see us and they're like, Oi, you're the ones that have been killing our, killing our pals, our brothers down in the, down in that ruin under the hillside. Um, and we're like, yeah, yeah, that's us. <laughs> um, but uh, we basically, we don't, we want to avoid, we want to avoid the fight with them if we can. I've just realised uh, these hit point totals need to be need to be put back up to the maximum. So, yeah, there's no point, there's no point denying it, I don't think. Um, I think the, the, the characters will be like, yeah, 
yeah, that's us because we're fighting back against them because they keep raiding our our village and the hobgoblins. Um, let's see, what can we do here? Um, why don't we say, yeah, uh, whoever that's talking to them, say Walton, the warrior, because he's got his massive two-handed sword on his back. The hobgoblins don't know that he has three hit points. <laughs> he can't, you know, he could be killed in one hit by by a goblin's dagger. They don't know that. So Walton says, yeah, yeah, that's us. We killed, we killed your brothers and we'll kill you if you don't get out of our way right now. So uh, why don't we do a personality check for him and see how he does. Okay, DC 10 tasks are a man's deed. The weak and unskilled could not likely achieve these tasks. Okay, yeah, I think we're just gonna, yeah, that's like an average one. We're gonna make it difficulty class 10 and see what happens. So he will roll a d20 and he doesn't have a, um, a modifier to add, does he? Because it's personality, no. So uh, yeah, he just rolls a straight d20 and we'll see how it, how it goes. He has to roll a 10. A two, all right. So the, um, the hobgoblins basically laugh at him and they're like, ah, you bunch of puny villagers playing at being heroes. You know, you're no adventurers, we're gonna take you down right now. And then they charge towards them. We're actually gonna leave it there on that cliffhanger before starting the actual battle because I've kind of run out of time for the evening and I may as well just edit this and upload it as a shorter episode so it's online faster. So I will see you all next time.